you might want to know, what is this thing called Brexit? Uh, this is a referendum that was promised by David Cameron as part of the Conservative Party platform in the last general election. It's been something that's been brewing for a long time. It's the first time that British voters have had a chance to vote on the membership of the European Union since 1975. Uh, and uh, which means that you would have to be in your late 50s if you ever actually had a say uh, in our membership in the EU. Uh, and this is a, an issue that has been rumbling along, certainly during the entire period that I've lived in the UK, which has been over 20 years now. Uh, but most of the prime ministers, and especially Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, deferred or basically denied the possibility of any sort of referendum largely on the grounds that British membership in the EU is more or less on British terms, given what the EU can formally do and still remain a union. However, uh, for reasons that are internal to the politics of the Conservative Party, David Cameron felt that he needed to put this uh, matter to a vote of the people. Uh, and uh, on top of that, uh, bec during the period when a vote wasn't being granted, uh, one of the uh, fringe parties uh, in the United Kingdom, the UK Independence Party, uh, started to gather quite a lot of momentum. Um, historically, it was generally a kind of um, uh, right-wing, kind of petty bourgeois party. Uh, but over the years, it's actually accumulated a, a much larger base of support uh, including a lot of disenchanted uh, working class uh, voters who in the past would have voted Labour. Uh, and so in the last general election, this party, which has been, which, whose main platform plank is to have an EU referendum, got four million votes. Admittedly, they only got one seat in Parliament, but they came very close in many other seats not only in terms of taking votes away from the Tories, but also taking votes away from Labour. And so let's say were there another general election and there hadn't yet been this EU referendum, uh, there would probably be many more members of UKIP in Parliament. So there's all these kinds of background political considerations, largely of a domestic and sort of, you might say, party political kind that motivated Cameron who I think personally didn't want to have a referendum because he's already committed to the UK staying in the EU, uh, but, but this was kind of forced upon him as a way of sort of keeping the political peace both within his own party and staving off the potential uh, threat of UKIP. So this, um, this uh, referendum takes place. Uh, there is a very long period, at least by British standards, of a campaign uh, for this. So, uh, it gets announced in February and the referendum takes place in June. By British standards, that's quite a long time for a campaign. Um, and um, the forces are lining up uh, in, 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 a, in a pretty predictable way. Uh, the people who are arguing for remaining in the European Union include uh, both the, the, all the major political parties, basically, the, the major, especially the people who are the primary spokespeople of those parties, though Cameron did allow his cabinet to uh, speak independently on the matter, and indeed some of, some of his uh, more uh, prominent cabinet members, uh, in fact, uh, broke ranks and became very instrumental in the Leave campaign, uh, and, uh, and probably the one who in a sense really came to the fore during this was uh, Michael Gove, the Justice Secretary. Um, now, on the side of Labour, uh, the Labour Party, those of you who know something about the history of the Labour Party, uh, back in 1975 when there was the EU referendum, um, there was actually very touch and go as to whether the Labour Party would support this. Uh, and even the Prime Minister of the day, Harold Wilson, um, was uh, kind of stood back from the debate uh, because he wanted to remain in office no matter what the outcome was, and he knew that even within his own party, ranks were very divided. And at that time, the person who was very much adamant that, the e that Britain should not remain in the EU was Tony Benn. Uh, and Tony Benn uh, was the leader of um, a kind of uh, radical left fringe of the Labour Party, one with a, a kind of closer alliance to Marxism as opposed to the sort of Fabianism 
uh, which is to say a kind of more moderate social democratic kind of form of socialism that in fact was part of the founding of the Labour Party in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but, but Ben, uh, supported by most of the unions uh, and the still very, which, which were actually playing a very important role in the funding and maintaining of the Labour Party back then, they were very skeptical of the European Union because the European Union was being portrayed in the 1970s as being this kind of um, basically large uh, super capitalist project uh, that was going to, in fact, make it more difficult for workers to assert their rights because basically it was the, uh, the, the way it was being presented was that the elites of the major countries were going to consolidate capital, consolidate, and, and the, the prospect of there being a common European currency was seen as a symbol of this at the time, um, and, and this was going to become a kind of nightmare for workers. Now, of course, the, this didn't happen, and in fact, one of the interesting features about the uh, European Union referendum campaign today is that, in fact, the European Union is normally invoked as providing the kinds of worker safeguards that otherwise might not be in place in Britain because, of course, between 1975 and now, we had the Thatcher Revolution, and the Thatcher Revolution, which to a large extent Tony Blair continued, in fact, uh, marked a, 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 an increasing erosion, first of all, of the power of unions to influence politics en masse, but also in various kinds of subtle and not so subtle ways, workers' rights. And so the European Union in this context serves as a kind of um, safeguard, uh, a, you know, in other words, a safeguard against neoliberalism going too far. And so uh, people uh, who have been very much concerned about social justice issues and fair pay, fair pay and various forms of, uh, you know, equality uh, have looked to the European Union as, in fact, a safeguard against what the British government might do normally. And that came out very clearly uh, in the referendum campaign this time. And so most of the Labour Party this time around were supportive of, uh, of Britain staying in the European Union. However, there is a notable exception, uh, and the notable exception uh, was the uh, leader of the Labour Party. Uh, now, the leader of the Labour Party is this guy, Jeremy Corbyn, who in a sense is very much a throwback to the kind of Tony Benn style of uh, Labour Party politics of the 1970s. Um, though he has moderated his views as the world has changed and, and all the rest of it. Um, so he was officially on the Remain side, but he was not very enthusiastic. However, what he does have is a lot of enthusiastic supporters who have swelled the membership ranks of the Labour Party. Um, and uh, these people, too, are very much of the same mindset of Tony Benn and the more kind of radical Marxist-oriented left of the 1970s. Um, and, and so the Labour Party during this referendum campaign uh, appeared very kind of um, un, uh, very equivocal, very unsure. And so basically the main thrust of the case uh, was being made by the Prime Minister and his allies in the Conservative Party, along with the Blairites of the Labour Party, who from the power position of the party are pretty much on the outside these days. Okay. So in that respect, the Remain campaign was politically very hobbled, I would say. Uh, but what they did have going for them, or at least they thought they had going for them, was the idea that most of the major business leaders, most of the major economists, most of the major experts in just about every field you can talk about, 90% of the academic community were for remaining in the European Union. So that was there. However, that kind of, uh, that kind of profile... Uh, which was very much in evidence in the way in which media coverage was uh, taking place in the European referendum, um, actually worked against the Remain side, I would say. Um, and Michael Gove, again, who is, was one of the masters of the, of the Leave campaign, made this point again and again by saying, we are fed up with experts. We don't need to be talked to by experts. He made a very direct appeal to, as it were, the people can decide for themselves. And so what the, um, what the Remain campaign was presenting as scenarios of anticipated economic downturns and possible social unrest on the back of a Brexit vote, um, people like Michael Gove and his allies were uh, basically saying, this is Project Fear. Okay, so this phrase Project Fear got used by the people who were campaigning 
uh, for leaving the European Union to stigmatize the people who wanted to remain. And Project Fear basically consisted in, show, in, 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 in showing the, the negative, the, that the project, that the remain people were basically emphasizing the negative consequences of leaving the European Union and not talking about anything positive that comes from remaining in the European Union. Now, this is not entirely true. Of course, pro the Remain campaign did talk about positive things, including the safeguarding of workers' rights and all this other stuff I mentioned earlier, but that really did not get through to the people. That was pretty clear. What did get through to the people was the idea that the people who were supporting Britain remaining in the European Union um, were patronizing. They were condescending to the people. They were basically telling the people, look, if you don't vote the way we want you to vote, we're going to scare you to death. We're going to tell you horrible things are going to happen. The locusts are going to come in. This was, so there was this kind of depiction uh, of, of, uh, of the Remain campaign, which they never really were able to get rid of. Um, whereas the, the Leave campaign, interestingly enough, even though a lot of their campaign support was based on people who wanted to have a kind of more um, closed border policy, right? One of the big issues that appeared in the campaign um, was the idea of control over immigration. Because as part of the European Union, Britain is, is, uh, it has available to itself uh, a kind of free trade zone. And the free trade zone means that no tariffs can be charged as, as, uh, as countries are trading across the European Union. It's an amazing thing, actually. It's quite an impressive thing, what's been arranged there. Um, but one of the conditions of being in this free trade zone is you also have to have the free movement of labor. And that means, in effect, that your ability to control your borders, especially with regard to European nationals, is minimal. Okay. Uh, now, what this has meant in practice over the last 10 years uh, is, in fact, the amount of EU immigration coming to the UK has basically gone up 10 times. Uh, and this has scared a lot of people. Uh, and this has been very much part of the um, Leave campaign's way of, uh, of promoting its message, uh, namely by pointing out how many migrants, mostly from Eastern Europe, they are really the people who are being targeted here, you might say, as the invaders, as it were. Um, and they are taking a lot of jobs. They are actually quite visible, especially in a lot of the market towns in the UK. They are the people who are often picking crops. They are people who are engaged in construction work. Uh, they are not people who are members of unions or anything, but they're being you know, paid for relatively unskilled labor. There's a lot of that going around. Uh, they take up a lot of housing. But one of the things they don't take up a lot of is uh, welfare and health care. And this is one thing that, again, the Remain campaign really never got across, but is an interesting fact about the immigration that comes from the EU. Namely, that contrary to a lot of people's concerns, uh, these migrants don't, in fact, use up a lot of public services, not, in, not when compared to the normal residents of the UK. Uh, and they take much fewer welfare benefits and so forth. But this was not how it was portrayed. It was portrayed uh, in terms of migrants invading the country uh, and, as it were, somehow causing Britain to lose its sense of national identity and sovereignty. Um, and that argument ended up working. Uh, and, and I think this really had a lot to do with what you might say, you know, at a very phenomenological level, how was it that ordinary people experienced the European Union? OK, because it's not like people are ordinarily thinking about directives coming from Brussels or or the fact that the European Court of Justice is protecting your rights and anything like that. People don't normally think about that. But what they do think about is the fact that they now have a Polish supermarket in their town. OK, that's something they think about. And so for them, that is what the European Union means. It means kind of Europe moving to Britain. Um, and I really think that very basic fact ended up winning it uh, for the Leave campaign which is very unfortunate uh, because all of that Project Fear stuff that the Remain campaign was talking about is in fact founded on a good evidence. So in fact, what we are already beginning to experience in the UK is this very, you know, we're, we're a turbulent economic period. The pound has already dropped. Stock market prices are going up and down. 
Uh, investment is pretty much halted because nobody knows exactly what Britain is going to do in terms of actually getting out of the European Union. So all of so there's an enormous amount of uncertainty, and of course the uncertainty is contagious, and so it spreads to Europe as well. Uh, and insofar as Britain has major trading relations with other countries in the world, there are ripple effects, and even countries like China have uh, made uh, statements, basically, uh, you know, expressing worry about the consequences of Brexit. Okay, so. Um, this has been a kind of a very significant event, and people often talk about it as the most significant constitutional event in this country for a hundred years, and that may well be true. Um, I mean, a lot depends on exactly what the outcome is, but um, I would say that right now, um, you know, if, if, if actually we were to negotiate something that looks like what the main Brexit people want, that would end up radically changing Britain's uh, relationship to other countries in the world. Um, and um, so I, I would say that, 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 that that's kind of, uh, you know, potentially available, but it's going to be something that is going to unfold over time, and, and I don't think we'll have a quick resolution. So um, a few things we know at this point. First of all, we, we know, I think with a certain degree of certainty, that the person who's going to become the next prime minister, who will be the head of the Conservative Party, will actually serve out the current term uh, uh, of office of David Cameron. Now, David Cameron, the prime minister, resigned immediately after the vote was lost. Uh, and um, this revealed many things very quickly, namely that there was no Brexit plan, either by the government or by the people supporting Brexit, because uh, nobody was expecting that it was going to win. Uh, that's just the basic fact. It sounds very strange to say that, but, but that is basically the truth. Um, so as a result, Britain is going to need a, quite a lot of time to figure out what it wants. Um, but it wants to do it, and, and, and according to the European Union Constitution, and the European Union has never gone through this process before, namely a country pulling out of the Union, but they do have a procedure. And the procedure involves invoking Article 50 of the Constitution, and Article 50 basically starts a clock of two years during which negotiations have to be completed, and if not, then there is a kind of option to, to continue or not, as the case may be. Um, the question and, and, and how the clock gets started is entirely in the hands of the country that is thinking about pulling out. Now, what is clear from looking at the main contenders to be the next prime minister, and that will be determined uh, by uh, September uh, or October, that uh, none of them would actually start would put will would would start the clock this calendar year. In other words, um, we are going to wait at least another six months before we even begin formal negotiations. Now, according to the European Union, you're not allowed to have informal negotiations before you have formal negotiations. But different ministers in different countries have different views on this matter. So something so there may be some kind of communication in the interim. But the point is, even among the people who have supported the Leave campaign, there is not a great deal of eagerness to implement this because uh, of the massive ramifications it has in terms of how Britain has to rewrite all of its laws, because all of British law has all the EU stuff wrapped up into it. It has to disentangle all that, and then it has to create whole new kinds of relations which uh, Britain in the past would have just got automatically by virtue of being a member of the European Union. So in other words, whereas in the past, you know, if you're part of the European Union, you're automatically on board with 27 other countries. Now we're going to have to have 27 separate agreements with those countries, okay? And the same goes also for the other places where we are parties to agreements as a member of the European Union. So this is very complicated stuff. Lawyers will have a field day. I mean, if you're thinking about what career to go into now, go into law, because there's going to be plenty of work for you. But the question is, until this stuff is worked out in some kind of detail, there is going to be no point to actually start the clock ticking on this. Now, this is going to be, I think, of considerable uh, disappointment to the people who supported the Leave campaign. Because the people who supported the Leave campaign, who remember, 
are people who are just thinking about the European Union in terms of the Polish supermarket they see on the street, they think this stuff can be dealt with pretty handily, right? Just close the borders, get those Europeans out of here, end of story. But that's not how it's going to work. And in fact, there's going to be a real problem with regard to the issue of migration, which was the crucial issue that won it for the Leave campaign. Because if Britain wants access to that free market, it is going to have to have the free movement of labor. And how exactly the Brexiteers, as they're known, will get around that issue in the negotiations is not at all clear. But what is clear is that Britain has to be part of the single free market, uh, given that an enormous percentage of the wealth that is generated in this country is actually generated through financial services, which is, uh, which is located in London, which is you know, the biggest financial uh, center in the world. And it's there, and it, and it has that status because of the easy access to the European markets. And if that were to go, Britain would take an incredible hit to the economy. So that's got to be the paramount thing. And those of you who have been following any of the way in which the people supporting Brexit after the vote have been portraying what it means to leave the European Union, it is quite clear that in their minds, the first priority is to preserve the single market, and the second priority is control immigration. But for the people who voted for Brexit, the priority is the other way around. And this is going to be a very difficult thing to finesse as time goes on, especially the longer it takes to negotiate Brexit. Um, and, and this is where I think, um, and this is where I think, you know, the other potential pitfall is down the road. Uh, and that is the, whether we would have another general election in this country. As I said before, the main contenders for the Tory leadership have all been pretty clear that they believe that the, that the current term should serve itself out to 2020, right? So that gives quite a lot of time in a way. Uh, and that there should not be a snap election. As you know, why would you want a snap election? Well, because you've got a new prime minister, first of all. Uh, second of all, because you might want to make it part of the campaign for people to vote on the agreement that's sort of on the table, once there is an agreement on the table. Um, so there, there are kind of these democratic reasons, you might say, for um, holding a, 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 a new general election. Um, but my guess is this will not happen, and I actually hope it does not happen, because to be honest with you, as someone who wanted to remain in the European Union, um, I think a bad situation that we have now would be made worse by a general election. Because my guess would be, if we do have a general election, given the way in which Brexit is likely to be negotiated, it's going to be drawn out, it's not going to be delivering on the migration promises that motivated the campaign, and that's going to become very evident to the people. And if they've got a chance to re respond to that point in a general election, you can definitely see the resurgence of UKIP in terms of people voting for it and getting large numbers of MPs in. And this, I think, would completely sink the country. Okay, And this really has nothing to do in a way... I mean, UKIP and a lot of these kinds of uh, Brexit parties have a reputation of being racist and xenophobic and so forth. Um, this may or may not be true, uh, but I do think because of the preoccupation that these people have with the sovereignty of the UK, the idea of controlling borders as a matter of somehow uh, a, a political prerogative, um, they can end up tanking the economy substantially. Britain would be incredibly diminished by these people uh, taking over. And the interesting thing I would say about the Tory party, uh, even if we're talking about Brexiteers like people like, you know, Michael Gove or Boris Johnson, the ex-mayor of, ex of London, who is also a very important figure in the campaign, is that these guys aren't preoccupied with migration at all, really. They're, you know, they're kind of liberal, libertarian type people, okay? They're, part, they're from that part of the Tory party. Uh, and so they don't want to, they don't necessarily want closed borders, okay? Um, so, so they're not too, you know, hot on this topic. But the problem is the people are hot on it and UKIP is hot on it. And if there were a general election, those people would be able to have another bite of the cherry, as it were, to really push a very hard Brexit line. So my guess is there will be no general election, um, but there will be problems down the road because Brexit, if it really does happen, will not look like what people thought they voted for.